Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In our last video, we explained how and why Joffrey's murder took place, from Littlefinger and Olena Tyrell's roles, to Tywin signing off on it, and most importantly, that Doran and Oberyn seemed to know it was going to happen before it did which could only be the case if Littlefinger is one of Doran's friends in King's Landing. We also expanded on what Doran indicated their plan was, with regards to getting revenge on Tywin for what happened to Elia and her children during the sack of King's Landing, which was to take everything he held dear, then kill him. To do this, they wanted to implicate Tywin in the murder of Elia and her children in front of all of the Dornish and Reach lords present at the trial by combat, thus beginning to weaken Tywin's position. Following the trial, Oberyn told Tyrion that he planned on leaving King's Landing and returning to Dorne, where he hinted that it was his and Doran's intention to crown Marcella, leaving one major obstacle that needed to be overcome for their plan to kill Tywin once everything started falling apart around him to come to fruition. Which is where what Littlefinger calls a hidden dagger comes into play, and is exactly where we will be picking up today. So, let's do this. Now, when trying to figure out who they could use to kill Tywin, the first place we went were Littlefinger's hidden daggers, i.e. the Kettleblacks. But we decided that they don't really suit the purpose, as they aren't exactly a subtle bunch, and killing Tywin is not something that could easily be accomplished. And even though Duran doesn't likely care if his hidden daggers survive, he almost certainly would want his hidden daggers to be successful. Operating under the assumption that this is a subtle plan, 16 years in the making, as the stranger told us, it seems likely that they had something a little more clever in mind. So, who in King's Landing could manage to get close enough to Tywin to pull this off? Probably someone who seems to have been working at getting close to him since we first met her. Shay. We first meet Shay inside Tywin's army camp at the beginning of the War of the Five Kings. And, although it sounds a little crazy, what better way to sneak a quote-unquote hidden dagger into Tywin's circle than sending in an unassuming girl to pose as a camp follower? No one pays camp followers any mind, and Duran, Oberyn, and Littlefinger seem to be the type of men that do their homework, and are likely to have, at the very least, heard some rumors about Tywin discreetly enjoying the company of a whore from time to time. In fact, there are some who believe that Tywin was the hand who built the secret tunnel to Shatayas. But in any event, when Tyrion arrived in Tywin's camp, he sent Bronn to find him a whore, stipulating that she should be reasonably young, clean, and with as pretty a face as he can find. Bronn came back with Shay, who, based on her physical description, has to have been among the prettiest girls hanging out around the camp. Now, we are given three stories as to how she ended up with Tyrion, two of which come from her and one from Bronn. According to Bronn, he took her from some random knight, who was loath to give her up until he mentioned that it was for Tyrion. The dirk he put to the guy's throat probably didn't hurt either. No more than a minute later, Tyrion asked Shay who Bronn took her from, and she told him that she was with a minor retainer of an insignificant lordling and mocked Tyrion by calling said mystery man a quote-unquote small man. The final account of how she ended up in Tyrion's tent came from Shay's testimony at Tyrion's trial. I never meant to be a whore, my lords. I was to be married, a squire he was, and a good brave boy, gentle born. But the imp saw me at the green fork and put the boy I meant to marry in the front rank of the van. And after he was killed, he sent his wildlings to bring me into his tent. 
Shaga, the big one, and Timmet with the burned eye. He said if I didn't pleasure him, he'd give me to them. So I did. Then he brought me to the city, so I'd be close when he wanted me. He made me do such shameful things. Okay, so most of what she said can't be disputed by anyone that's there, even though the entirety of her testimony, with the exception of her saying that she was Tyrion's whore, is a lie. Now, although her testimony on the surface appears to be quite damning to Tyrion's cause, there is one aspect that can absolutely be disputed, and call much or all of what she said into question. She said that she was with a gentle-born squire, whatever the hell that means, that she was going to marry, until Tyrion ordered him placed into the vanguard where he was killed. The problem with this statement is the fact that there weren't any knights or squires in the vanguard that day, and anyone who was there would know that. So men like Adam Marbrand and Kevin Lannister, who were both there that day, and were also noted in the text to have been under the impression that Tyrion was absolutely positively guilty prior to Shay's testimony, must now be wondering why Tywin would allow such a blatant lie to stand. And if he's willing to let this lie go uncorrected, how many other lies has he let stand? Which could easily have both of them starting to wonder if Tyrion is innocent and being framed. Especially since both of them are well aware of the fact that Tywin has wanted to rid himself of Tyrion for years. But let's get back to how Shay ended up in Tyrion's tent, and we'll circle back to her testimony in a minute. Bronn said he took Shay from some random night, and Shay elaborated on this and tells Tyrion that she was with a minor retainer of an insignificant lordling. So what was one of the prettiest girls in the camp doing with one of the least important men there? Now, I can't exactly claim to be an expert on how these things work, but it stands to reason that men of higher standing would get their pick of the girls, and the insignificant men would have to choose from what's left over. So, once again, how did this extremely attractive girl end up with this random guy? This seems to leave us with one of two options. A. She was buying her time and waiting to be noticed by someone that mattered, or B, she was actually a very important man's whore. A man who is extremely busy and very discreet, and wouldn't want anyone knowing that he likes to dabble with prostitutes from time to time, who would want to make sure no one else enjoyed the pleasure of her company. So, he had her spend her days with a man that no one pays attention to. So, when he had time for some TLC, he could summon her under the discreet cover of darkness. A man such as Tywin. This brings us back to her Oscar-worthy performance at Tyrion's trial, where she perfectly executed her role as the damsel in distress, claiming she never meant to be a whore, and how Tyrion ordered the squire she was to marry into the van so he'd likely die, even though Tywin was actually the only one with the authority to do something like that. At a quick glance, Everyone assumes that Shay's testimony came directly from Cersei, and given Cersei's propensity for placing her father in situations where he'd probably like to snap her neck, that is entirely possible. But what if Shay actually did that all on her own, and she was really putting on this grand show to either gain or regain Tywin's attention? After all, Tyrion even noted that every man in the room likely wanted to take her into his arms and comfort her, and the next time we see her, she was in Tywin's bed. So, did Tywin feel bad for her and summon her? Or did Shay later go to him and tell him that she not only had to suffer through Tyrion's embraces, but after she did what Cersei asked of her, Cersei refused to pay her what was owed? That would have been a really smart thing to do if she did that, as just about everyone in this entire world knows how Tywin feels about Lannisters paying their debts. Either way, Shay's journey started in Tywin's army camp and ended in Tywin's bed, placing her in the perfect position to kill him when the time came, and, as an added bonus, her time spent with Tyrion gave her intimate knowledge of the secret passageways in and out of the Tower of the Hand, so when she completed the job, 
she would be able to sneak out without anyone either knowing she was there or ever seeing her leave. Okay, now that we've established why Shay would be the perfect hidden dagger for the job, it seems like what's missing is how she could possibly be connected to Littlefinger, Oberyn, or Doran. Well, let's start with her connection to Littlefinger. When Tyrion went to Shay to tell her that he was going to marry Sansa, she already knew. Tyrion said his father was keeping it a well-guarded secret, not wanting Elena Tyrell to find out until it was too late to do anything about it. Yet Shay claims that Tywin was just sitting around, talking openly about it with Kevin, with serving girls in the room, who she claims then told a hedge knight named Talad who happened to be talking about it at the Sept when she brought Lawless there. I think not. The only reason a guy like Tywin would talk about something sneaky in front of serving girls would be if he was counting on what he was talking about reaching the ears of someone he intended to bait with said information. And that wasn't the case with this. That basically means there's an exactly 0% chance the source of her information was what she said it was. She seemed to very quickly realize it wasn't a very good lie, as the moment she finished saying it, she decided it was the perfect time to get naked and tell him that she really doesn't give a fig that he's to marry Sansa. In other words, she distracted him with her sexiness, then hurt his feelings, thus making sure he didn't give what she said much additional thought. And it worked. So, how did she know that Tyrion was marrying Sansa? Well, it was Littlefinger who set this entire thing into motion, so he seems to be the most logical source for this information. So, was Shay one of Littlefinger's whores that just so happened to be a top-secret assassin? I mean, I guess it's possible that Littlefinger trained one of his whores to be a hidden dagger. But there is another man in the story that seems to have been training young girls to be hidden daggers for years, and his name is Oberyn Martell. Each and every one of his daughters that are old enough to be deadly are, in their own special way. Obara is basically just a complete brute. Nim seems to have ten daggers hidden on her at all times, and is very skilled in their use. Tyene is completely terrifying as she appears to anyone that doesn't know her, to have an otherworldly innocence to her. But the reality is, she's a faceless men-level practitioner of poison that could kill you with the most innocent of touches. The four youngest daughters are obviously too young to be hidden daggers. But then there's Sorella. She is nowhere to be found. So what do we know about Sorella? Well, she's 19 to 20 years old in A Dance with Dragons, loves Old Town, and her sisters in Ariane don't like her because she's annoying, always trying to butt in where she doesn't belong, and asks a ridiculous amount of questions. Now, before we move forward, I feel like we would be remiss to ignore the fact that over 52% of the sample in a 2015 Reddit poll think that Sorella is posing as Alaris the Sphinx, an acolyte of the Citadel. And on paper, everything does seem to line up. But... When you really stop and think about the actual logistics of this, it seems really hard to accept that it could actually be possible. Given the fact that little over half of the people polled think Alaris is Sorella, there is obviously some compelling evidence to support it. The name Alaris is Sorella spelled backwards, which I must admit is pretty interesting. Alaris also has a widow's peak like Oberyn, is in Old Town, which Sorella is said to love, and has a Dornish father and a summer islander for a mother. This all lines up with what we know about Sorella, but none of that explains how a 19 to 20 year old girl managed to pass herself off as a man for a little over a year at the Citadel. The Archmaesters, novices, and acolytes at the Citadel aren't exactly brute idiots and Alaris has been eating, drinking, living, and according to Lazy Leo, bathing regularly with and around all these men and boys for over a year. Arya couldn't fool Gendry for more than a few weeks, and she was eight. 
which should make it considerably easier to accomplish passing as a boy, especially when considering that she has already shown a propensity for being mistaken as a boy. Actually, Gendry called her out on being a girl after a few weeks, which means he probably noticed it well before that. A 19 to 20 year old girl has breasts, hips, and other distinctly female features that seem like they would make this nearly impossible to accomplish. Then, when you consider the fact that all the girls down at the Quill and Tankard swoon over Alaris, the idea that Alaris is Sorella seems almost ridiculous. If one of the girls seemed to like him, that would be one thing, but all of them doting on him is another. There are inherent traits that play a significant role in the science of attraction, and this simply doesn't compute. Also, a guy like Lazy Leo, who is a complete ass, a very smart ass, but an ass nonetheless, and also seems to spend an awful lot of time around Alaris, would have called him out by now if he even had the slightest hint that he was really a she. Then there's the fact that Alaris and his acolyte friends seem to drink together fairly regularly down at the Quill and Tankard. I, for one, have never met someone that can just knock back drinks without eventually feeling the need to relieve themselves. And since they hang out next to the river, and they're young men, I'd imagine that that's where they're doing it. I would have to think that one of them would have noticed that Alaris had never taken a piss in the entire year they've known him. I mean, that's how Gendry seemed to have noticed that Arya was a girl. On top of that, Alaris's personality doesn't line up with what we know about Sorella. Alaris doesn't seem to annoy anyone. In fact, he seems like he's the quote-unquote coolest guy in their little group of friends. He also doesn't appear to be in the habit of bombarding people with questions, and never once tries butting in where he doesn't appear to belong. This brings us to the official artwork of Sorella, which can be found in George's The Art of Ice and Fire, and in the Game of Thrones card game from Fantasy Flight Games. In The Art of Ice and Fire, the picture of Sorella is labeled Dornish Assassin, which seems like an apt description, considering that all of Oberyn's other daughters could certainly be described as such, and she clearly doesn't appear to look like a man. In fact, she kind of looks like Shay. This got us thinking about the fact that Sorella is said to have a summer islander for a mother. Then, it occurred to us that there are actually a lot of Rhoynish women in the Summer Isles, on what came to be known as the Isle of Women, as this is one of the places Nymeria stopped on her way to Dorne. This makes it entirely possible that Sorella's mother was a Summer Islander of Rhoynish descent, which could have been what drew over into her in the first place. So, with all that in mind, Let's compare what we know about Sorella and see how it lines up with what we know about Shay. They are both 19 to 20 years old. They are both extremely annoying. They both ask a ridiculous amount of questions. And they both try butting in where they don't belong. Then, let's look at Shay's physical description. Well, she essentially looks Dornish. And, like Oberyn, she has large black eyes. In one of the few direct references from the story that we have about Sorella, Doran orders Ario Hota to seize all of the sand snakes, even the little ones. Ario Hota then asks, What of Sorella? And Doran replies, Unless she returns to Dorne, there's not I can do about Sorella, save pray that she shows more sense than her sisters. Leave her to her... game. So this statement has two vitally important parts. The first implies that Sorella is in a place that Doran cannot retrieve her from. If she was in Old Town at the Citadel, how hard would it be to just send someone there to bring her back to Dorn? As Pate explained, an acolyte or novice can disappear from the Citadel and no one is going to come looking for them. So this is another point that discredits the idea that Alaris is Sorella as Doran believes she is in a place that he cannot retrieve her from. The second interesting part of Doran's statement is to leave her to her game. Well, 
what better place is there to play the Game of Thrones, or any game for that matter, than King's Landing? So, if Shay is actually Sorella, how did she end up being a hidden dagger whore, and what's her weapon of choice? Well, a wise man once said that the best lies contain within them elements of truth, enough to give the listener pause. And according to Shay, she ran away when her father tried to make her his kitchen wench and his whore. Actually, the first time he asked her, she told him that she ran away because her father made her his whore, and the second time he asked her, she told him that she ran away because he tried to make her his kitchen wench, and when Tyrion called her out on it, she quickly just combined the two. Interestingly, she told Tyrion that she isn't nearly as good in the kitchen as she is between the sheets, and her cooking is like to poison anyone who eats it, which seems like it just might be a subtle clue about her true identity. As Oberyn himself said, who knows more of poisons than the Red Viper of Dorne? And if Tyene's poisoning skills are anything to go by, he's one heck of a teacher. And like we said earlier, Oberyn seems to have been training his eldest daughters to be hidden daggers ever since he started going around collecting them. But how do you train your daughter to be an assassin whore? Well, it goes back to the best lies containing within them elements of truth. It seems likely that Oberyn literally bowed, bent, and broke her, transforming her into the hidden dagger that he needed for the job. A compliant little sex kitten, as George put it. Also, when you think about it, if Oberyn had to choose one of his daughters for this job, Sorella's definitely the one to pick. She's the smartest. She's gorgeous. Her mother isn't around to stop him or say anything about it. And none of the other girls like her. So when she all of a sudden drops off the face of the earth, they are far less likely to ask follow-up questions about her or want to go visit her wherever Oberyn and Duran said she was. Yes, I do realize that this sounds insane, but Oberyn did tell Tyrion that he and Elia were as close as Jaime and Cersei, which definitely has an underlying tone that would indicate that incest is not something that stands between the Red Viper and what he wants. And what he wants, more than anything in this world, is revenge. When George was asked about Shay's presence in Tywin's bed in a June 2014 interview with Entertainment Weekly, he said that there is more to it than he is willing to talk about, and that it will be revealed in future books. Something he did feel comfortable elaborating on, with regards to Shay, are the differences between the show's version of her and his. During this portion of his response, he flat out said that Book Shay doesn't give a shit about Tyrion. He also described her as a manipulative, compliant sex kitten that used him for money. When keeping that in mind, and looking at the fact that Tyrion set her up in a manse with servants and jewelry and everything she could ever want, it seems pretty odd that instead of counting her blessings and hoping Tyrion hardly ever found the time to pay her a visit, she attempted to butt in where she didn't belong, as Sorella is known to do, and continuously bothered him about bringing her into the Red Keep. If she doesn't like or even care about Tyrion, and she had all the gold and jewels she could ever dream of, there has to be another reason she wanted into the Red Keep that has nothing to do with Tyrion. Better still, when Tyrion told her Stannis was coming to kill them all, and that he thought she should leave, why wouldn't she just bounce to Old Town with the small fortune Tyrion had bestowed on her and never look back? Instead of doing that, she chose to give up the easy life Tyrion offered her to become Lawless's maid, a position where she goes from being served to being the servant, and she can't even wear any of the nice things he bought her. Tyrion mistakes her actions to mean she wants to be close to him, but George made it clear that Tyrion was dead wrong. 
It seems like John isn't the only point of view character who knows nothing. Given all of that, it seems likely that she was trying to get in there to make friends and be an ear at court. Something else that seems worthy of noting is the fact that one of the gifts Tyrion gave her was a beautiful white bird from the Summer Islands. George could have had Tyrion give her an exotic gift from anywhere, yet he chose to have Tyrion give her something from the Summer Isles. Shay also has a very Sand Snake lack of fear. She doesn't appear to be scared of anyone or anything. Sometimes she might pretend to be a deer in the headlights, like at Tyrion's trial, but she has a fearlessness that when added to her insolent and wicked smile, big bold black eyes, and an ability to fake it in the bedroom like only Ariane can, that just completely screams Sand Snake. She also seems to know how to do things that lowly whores shouldn't know how to do. For instance, she knew exactly what she was doing when she helped Pod strap Tyrion's armor on the morning after we met her. That doesn't really seem to be the type of thing that whores in this story know how to do. She also took to being a maidservant quite easily. I know they made a big joke out of how bad Shay was at it in the show, but in the books, she didn't show any signs of being inept at her job, which really makes you wonder how this lowly whore knows how to tend for a high-born lady. The last thing that she seems to know how to do that she absolutely shouldn't is see through a glamour. When Varys showed up at Shay's manse in what appears to have been a begging brother glamour, Shay saw right through it, which absolutely shocked Varys. A lot of people think that he's just a mummer and uses tricks to disguise himself. But if that were the case, why was he so noticeably shocked that she knew it was him? Varys is not really a man who allows what he's thinking to show. So it's a pretty big deal when he actually does let you know what he's thinking. And he not only looked shocked when she recognized him, he then turned and stomped off afterwards, which is truly uncharacteristic of Varys, who is literally noted to move silently by just about every point of view character that meets him. Melisandre and the Kindly Man are the only ones who tell us how glamours work, and since about 90-95% to 95 of what the Kindly Man says is a complete lie, we feel like there has to be more to seeing through a glamour than just a pair of sharp eyes, as he told Arya. After all, Mance was glamoured as the Lord of Bones and was wandering about Castle Black relatively freely. If all it took was one pair of sharp eyes to expose him, doesn't it seem like it would be impossible that no one figured out it was him? And that includes John who is actually referenced several times to have eyes that don't miss a thing, which sounds like the same thing as having sharp eyes. Melisandre's only concern with regard to Mance's glamour was it failing, which is why she was so adamant about him wearing the bones. It also seems likely that a glamour's effectiveness is largely due to people's expectations, which is why once Shay pointed out that it was Varys, all of a sudden, the fat, stinking, begging brother that Tyrion originally saw was gone, and all that was left was Varys dressed in begging brother's garb. Something else that seems worth mentioning is the fact that Varys clearly hates just about everything about Shay. He is, once again, a man known for subtlety, but when it comes to Shay, he makes almost no effort to conceal his distaste for her. There's also a really interesting parallel between the way Varys treats Shay and the way that Lysono Mar treats Arianne. Both Varys and Lysono patronize their prospective Dornish girls with a smile and a laugh, while their eyes remain ice cold. Then there's the fact that we learn more about Ilaria Sand from Shay than any other character, including Oberyn and the two Dornish point of view characters. Shay pretty much tells Sansa Ilaria's life story, from her lowly beginnings as a bastard courtesan, to her rise to being the closest thing to a princess, to her worship of a Lysini love goddess. Why does Shay know everything about her? 
I guess people might have been gossiping about Ilaria around the Red Keep, but Shay being the one who provides us with this information seems particularly relevant when considering everything else. Then there's the Strangler Stone hairnet that none other than our darling Shay meticulously places in Sansa's hair the day of the wedding feast. Upon first receiving the hairnet, Sansa notes how fine and delicate it was, but Shay handled it with ease, so much so that when Sansa was trying to get the hairnet out during her escape, she actually thinks to herself that she wished Shay was there to help her with it. This got us to thinking about how Shay was the last person to touch the hairnet prior to the Queen of Thorns removing one of the stones. Given the delicate nature of the hairnet, it seems it would be prudent to have one of the stones loosened, so that when the Queen of Thorns went to grab for it, she didn't break the entire thing. Since giving Sansa a hairnet with a stone already loosened could rouse her suspicion, they needed someone to do it once it was in her hair, which is where Shay comes in, and might explain why she was so adamant about making it to the wedding feast. Now, before we summarize, we wanted to end this video by giving you a true depiction of just how convincing this girl is in whatever role she's playing. Whether it be the damsel in distress that had every man in the throne room wanting to comfort her, or this scene where she's using literally every tool in her arsenal trying desperately to push in where she doesn't belong, the wedding feast. And pay special attention to what she says she really wanted to see there. I don't want to leave. You promised you'd move me into a manse again after the battle. A Lannister always pays his debts, you said. Shay, God be damned. Stop that. Listen to me. You have to go away. The city's full of Tyrells just now, and I am closely watched. You don't understand the dangers. Can I come to the king's wedding feast? Lawless won't go. I told her no one's like to rape her in the king's own throne room, but she's so stupid. Simon says there's to be a singer's tourney and tumblers, even a fool's joust. Tyrion had almost forgotten about Shay's thrice damned singer. How is it you spoke to Simon? I told Lady Tanda about him, and she hired him to play for Lawless. The music calms her when the baby starts to kick. Simon says there's to be a dancing bear at the feast, and wines from the arbor. I've never seen a bear dance. They do it worse than I do. It was the singer who concerned him, not the bear. One careless word in the wrong ear, and Shay would hang. Simon says there's to be 77 courses and a 100 doves baked into a great pie. When the crust's opened, they'll all burst out and fly. So, in this scene, Tyrion is, not for the first time, trying to get her to leave the city, and Shay is having none of it. She actually seemed to pretend that she didn't even hear him. And she was so determined to go to the feast that she actually tried again later with Sansa. And, did you happen to notice that two of the things that she said she really wanted to see were the pigeon pie and the fool's joust? as in the two events that Littlefinger meticulously planned that directly preceded Joffrey's death and set the stage for Tyrion to be framed for it? I guess, being Oberyn's daughter, she didn't want to miss the beginning of the end of House Lannister, as any dutiful daughter would. Okay, so let's sum this all up. Shay is likely to be Sorella Sand, a.k.a. Sand Snake Number 4, who seems to have been molded into the perfect hidden dagger to kill Tywin Lannister. Like Sorella, Shay is 19 to 20 years old, is extremely annoying, never stops asking questions, and relentlessly attempts to push in where she doesn't belong. She has Oberyn's insolence, as well as his big, bold black eyes. When Duran decided to seize all the Sand Snakes after Oberyn's death, including the little ones, he indicated that Sorella was someplace where he couldn't get to her, and the Red Keep seems like the only place in Westeros that he wouldn't be able to just send someone to go bring her home. 
Even though George told us she's a manipulative, compliant little sex kitten that doesn't give a shit about Tyrion, she refuses to leave. And no matter how much gold, jewels, and silk dresses he throws at her, or how many times Tyrion tells her she should go because the situation is growing more dangerous by the day, she just completely ignores him and continuously acts like she wants to be closer to him, which seems to have been the method through which she intended to gain access to the Red Keep. When given the option between leaving and living the good life wherever she decided to go, and staying and becoming Lawless's maidservant, she chose to become a servant. And even though she was finally in the Red Keep, like she had asked, she still wasn't satisfied, and immediately began bombarding Tyrion with requests for more access to court. She's incredibly manipulative, and is willing to do whatever she has to, to get what she wants. She knows how to do things that lowly whores shouldn't, like lacing up armor, serving a high-born lady, and seeing through glamours. She also continuously issues backhanded insults to Tyrion, just like her father did when he first met him. Except she does it under the guise of ignorance. She also seems to have connections to Littlefinger, which is why she knew that Tyrion was going to marry Sansa before Tyrion told her. She also seems to have been working towards getting near Tywin since the first time we met her, starting in Tywin's army camp and ending in Tywin's bed, making her the perfect hidden dagger for the job, as she also capitalized on her time with Tyrion by learning how to sneak in and out of the Tower of the Hand unnoticed through the secret passageways. Shea lies like she was born to do it, and seamlessly transitions from role to role, whether it be a damsel in distress or a fearless sand snake, or a manipulative little sex kitten. She perfectly executes whatever she needs to be at any given time. In other words, this girl, for all intents and purposes, is no one. <laughs>